Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Resnick, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Public Health Practice and Training and a Senior Scientist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I am delighted to welcome all of you to this installment of the Johns Hopkins Congressional Briefing Series, where Johns Hopkins experts provide you a briefing on a topic of interest to policymakers, and then we get the opportunity to engage in real-time questions and answers. In today's briefing, our panel will discuss the impact of natural disasters affecting the United States. And as we all know, the recent tornadoes that have ravaged areas of the South and Midwest, droughts and floods that have impacted Californians, there is no shortage of natural disasters that Americans must prepare for, respond to, and recover from. Data also informs us that these natural disasters are coming with higher price tags whose cost ultimately falls onto the American people. So we are very excited today to talk about what policymakers can do to help mitigate the impact of these disasters on a human, material, and economic level. I am very pleased to be joined by four of my John Hopkins colleagues today. We will be hearing from Dr. Matthew Levy, who is the Deputy Director of Operational Medicine and an Associate Professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He works closely with multiple local, state, and federal emergency medical services, special operations medicine, and disaster medicine response elements. In today's briefing, Dr. Levy will discuss the latest real-world strategies in responding to disasters in the U.S. more effectively. Then we will also hear from Dr. Paul Ferraro, who is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Human Behavior and Public Health Policy at the Johns Hopkins Carey School of Business, at Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the Whitting School of Engineering. His work seeks to identify the causal links between the actions we take to improve our world and the impacts of those actions. Dr. Ferraro will also discuss policy proposals that could help mitigate the economic cost of natural disasters. Then we will hear from Dr. Janae Smith, who is an assistant professor of environmental health and engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Whitting School of Engineering. Her research focuses on understanding the disproportionate burden of a changing climate on vulnerable populations and the impacts of neighborhood level environmental exposures. Dr. Smith will also be discussing communities across the nation that are being disproportionately impacted by climate disasters. And then we will hear from Dr. Benjamin Zadek, a professor of earth and planetary sciences at the Johns Hopkins Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. His research is directed at understanding, managing, and coping with climate and hydrologic variability. Dr. Zatchik will be discussing the various ways in which we can deal with climate variability. Before I turn to each of these panelists for their remarks, I want to remind all of you in the audience that we will be providing answers to your questions in real time. So please submit your questions for our panelists in the box at the bottom of your screen. All right, now we get to get to the main event. We're going to turn to each of our panelists for a brief overview of their uh, research in these key topic areas. Matt Levy, could you please discuss some of the real world strategies when responding to climate disasters? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all and uh, for giving a little bit of your time during a beautiful spring day. Um, thank you for the warm introduction. So as mentioned, my name is Matt Levy. I'm a member of the faculty at Johns Hopkins. I'm a practicing emergency physician at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I'm also an academic EMS physician researcher and EMS medical director uh, in, the, in the Maryland and greater central mid-Atlantic area. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here with you, and this is a topic very near and dear uh, to my heart, so I'm going to try to unpack this as quickly as possible. Before we uh, really speak to the critical issues facing our emergency health services system during disaster preparedness and response, I just want to provide a little bit of context, a little bit of background about the current challenges that face our emergency care system. You see, our emergency health services system, which encompasses both pre-hospital 911 EMS response and hospital and specialty center care for time critical emergencies is really designed for exactly that. It's to get the right care to the right patient at the right time when a time critical illness is occurring or an injury is occurring. 
So one of the things I want you to take away from my short briefing here is it's not just about the disaster response that has the potential to be affected following a disaster event, a natural disaster event in particular, but it's also about the ability of that health system and that EMS system to go on to continue to meet a community's needs for the everyday emergencies, such as heart attacks, strokes, traumatic injuries, uh, and sepsis and other time critical illnesses that may occur. Now, historically, we used to be able to con uh, count on this this concept and this perspective that there's always a little bit of reserve, a little bit of, of, of capability or surge capacity. But the reality, one of the things that COVID has taught us and all the shifts that we're seeing uh, both in delivery of healthcare and workforce related issues is that those reserves simply are no longer there. So what we're really speaking about is resilience, is how can we better optimize our systems to bend and not break under stress, and how and where do we focus on and bolster readiness across the health sector and across levels of government in the context of not just natural disasters, but all disasters, to ensure that we can provide the best care for the most number of patients possible. Possible, excuse me. Now, natural disasters, including hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, and, and may, floods, and, and many others, have the ability to severely strain our healthcare systems in a couple of different ways. And it's important that we we kind of go through some of those. First and foremost, the biggest thing I need everyone to understand is that our emergency care system is already at a functional breaking point. Hospital emergency departments are experiencing historic wait times, uh, longer than ever recorded previously. Uh, hospital emergency departments and hospital acute care uh, services are overcrowded and uh, there's a, a problem with boarding of admitted patients. In fact, that's the single biggest factor contributing uh, to the length of stay in emergency departments. Now, natural disasters can obviously exacerbate this issue uh, and, and may, may cause a hospital to reach capacity uh, due to both an increased influx of patients, uh, but also limited resources and maybe even staff effects on those events. Uh, we've seen this during hurricanes and other types of disasters as well, where that workforce members themselves are victims of the disasters and that limits the ability uh, for the healthcare system to respond. So planning for and maximizing our readiness for these natural disasters is an essential first step in ensuring that we can receive, we can provide uh, this essential care for our patients to receive. Surge readiness is one of the items we'll focus on. Natural disasters can result in a sudden surge of patients or an influx of patients requiring medical care or specialty services care, and they can overwhelm a hospital's capacity that's already at, at peak levels. Hospitals need to be prepared for these surges of patients. And what we really are talking about, everybody, is surges within surges, quite honestly. And that's a pretty complex com uh, concept to grasp. Uh, we need to have not just sufficient beds, which is a euphemism for treatment space and resources, but also the necessary equipment, supplies, and personnel ready and able to meet this demand. As hospitals, we need to think, and healthcare systems and emergency uh, care environments, we need to think about the threats that face our ability to deliver everyday services, right? So the concept of doing threat assessments, uh, to look at our critical infrastructure, to ensure that the infrastructure is not only existent, but is optimized to handle and, and respond to the disaster. Uh, let me give you one concrete example to make this to make this more uh, relevant. Uh, one of the biggest problems we face uh, following natural disasters is loss of power, electrical power. All hospitals are required to have backup power. And as we've seen during major weather events over the past decade in particular, um, many hospitals have elected to place their, if not their generator equipment, certainly their fuel supply systems for those generators in subterranean locations. And that can be a problem if the water, if the groundwater contaminates those or if that system becomes offline. So it's not just having the equipment, it's having the equipment that itself has to be resilient and able to work under stress and under, uh, on, under atypical circumstances. So as I wrap up my portion here, I wanna leave you with a couple of thoughts. Uh, coordination with local, regional and state emergency management and, and health agencies is absolutely essential for both surge readiness and response. Crossing across collaboration across health systems is very important as well. And we need to really change the paradigm behind the current way that exercises and training activities are conducted. We need to shift the mindset from these being a necessary requirement to meet regulatory and accreditation requirements to those of an opportunity to really test our systems, our plans, and ensure that they're going to work the way we want them to.
We need to think about our workforce resilience. Uh, our workforce within healthcare is already stressed and strained, as many of you know, but we need to think about the physical, emotional, and and family health and wellness issues of, of our workforce. If you want your workforce to be successful and all in, we've got to make sure that they and their families are taken care of so, they're, so that they're not preoccupied with that. We have to really uh, prioritize and ensure the health care workers um, have the resources they need uh, to not only do their jobs well, but also have a safe way for them to, to ask for help and mental health resources should they need it. Staffing, equipment, supplies, space, these are all essential issues that we have to think about for disaster preparedness and all come uh, front and center when we think about natural disaster response. Now, investing in local and regional resources is one thing that we absolutely can do and need to do more of to help bolster a community's readiness. Uh, there are uh, regional healthcare coalitions uh, that, that really have shown their ability uh, to work very well, um, and we need to continue to support that. We need to invest in disaster response infrastructure, uh, not just not just the stuff, but the systems behind the stuff to do things well. And um, and we really need to to make this a priority because, uh, as my colleagues will share with you very shortly, um, the frequency and intensity of these events is only going to continue to increase. So with that, I'm going to wrap up my portion of the talk and turn it back over. I would say that uh, collaboration uh, between healthcare providers, our emergency responders, and public officials is absolutely essential as we prepare our communities and try to be as able to respond not just to the needs of the disaster, but also the ongoing and everyday needs of emergency medical care in our country. Thank you so very much for your attention and for the opportunity to speak on this. I look forward to the discussion portion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. My husband's a paramedic, first responder, so I appreciated your talk both on a personal and a policy level, so thank you so much. Next, we're going to turn to Paul. Um, could you share what advice uh, we could offer to policymakers when they are considering policy solutions to climate disasters? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm gonna to try to use the slides. I don't know if someone's gonna, there we go, that's great. So uh, welcome everyone, I'm Paul Ferraro. I am an economist, I'm gonna focus on policies and economic costs of natural disasters. With only five minutes, I'm only gonna make one central point and a couple of implications from that point. But to understand uh, the context that I'm focusing on, I'm sorry about the fonts, they seem when I uploaded them, they seem to have uh, been displaced. I'm gonna focus on weather disasters. And as we just mentioned, we're facing a permanent increase in the severity and probability of storms. And just as an anecdote to illustrate that point, in the past two decades, public flood insurance pay payouts in the US have increased over 20 fold. Yet the contrast is that we're still under investing in adaptation. And a parallel anecdote in the flood context is that in high risk flood zones, fewer than 60% of homeowners purchase flood insurance. And this is actuarially better than fair insurance, which means that people would be better off buying this, yet we see fewer than two thirds doing it. And particularly poor households who are most exposed to this risk from weather disasters are even uh, less insured, less than 50%. And so the, the key point I want to highlight is that we've got two approaches. Again, sorry about the font displacement. Uh, we've got pre and post disaster approaches to reducing damage from natural disasters, right? So the post disaster approach is disaster relief. We go in and give people what they need to rebuild uh, and recover. Pre-disaster uh, pre is where we try to make investments in things like seawalls and flood insurance markets and information in resilience of our healthcare system so that when a disaster comes, it can mitigate the, the damages that we're likely to experience. And uh, an underappreciated fact is the tension between these two approaches, uh, that there's a, a countervailing trend. So recent disaster relief is good because people need uh, relief after the disaster, but it has a downside in that it creates a disincentive. That expectation that there will be relief creates a disincentive to invest in adaptation investments in advance. Or another way to view that is it creates an incentive to expose oneself to more risk than one would otherwise in the absence of that expectation that there'll be relief after the disaster. And in a uh, recent paper, really well done empirical paper, they estimated that the provision of disaster relief in the US 
increases the damage from storms by an average of $3.2 billion per year. And to give you a sense of that scale, that's roughly about 40% of what FEMA spends each year in disaster relief. And again, where's that coming from? It's coming from this, what's often called moral hazard, this increase in risk as a result of people's expectations that there'll be relief. So one really important thing that has to be wrestled with is that tension between disaster relief and adaptation, between the pre and post disaster interventions that we do. And the other thing to keep in mind is on the adaptation investment side, when we're talking about government intervention, we spend a lot of time getting money out the door to a variety of different levels and different actors, businesses, households, local communities. Government is best used when we're trying to mitigate market or coordination failure. So market failures being one example is what's on there in the red font on the left, that we've created this moral hazard and we have to countervail that with government interventions to encourage more investment and adaptation. Coordination failures are where multiple jurisdictions would actually benefit from collaborating and coordinating their investments, but may not have the private incentives to do that. And so the government can intervene to help with coordination. And second, that often adaptation investments will not be equitable for a variety of reasons. And government has a key role in ensuring those investments are equitable. And just to, to wrap up, I wanted to focus on one particular market failure, going back to the flood insurance context. There have been a variety of bills that have been considered in the uh, Congress over the last couple of years trying to improve flood insurance markets. A lot of them focus on the functioning of these markets, particularly something called adverse selection. This is a problem where businesses, communities, households have better information about their flood risk than the insurers, and that disrupts the functioning of these markets. But there's been a really nice study, empirical study by Catherine Wagner, uh, showing that that's probably not the major problem and that people's faulty risk perceptions are much more likely to be the key issue. And that implies that a lot of policy approaches should be focused on improving decision tools so people can accurately uh, uh, assess their own risk. And perhaps mandates would actually be, although politically challenging, social welfare improving uh, because it is challenging for people to evaluate their, their own risks. And the nice thing about both of those approaches is that we can experiment uh, with approaches to improve that and see how they work before we scale them up to the entire country. So I think I'm out of time and I appreciate your uh, attention and I look forward to the questions afterward. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Paul. That was really uh, enlightening and, and helpful to think that through the way you presented it. Thank you. Uh, we next are gonna be turning to Janae um, to examine what populations are experiencing the bulk of the burden of climate disasters and how we might be able to fix that. So thanks, Janae. Thank you. Um, well, the research literature related to climate disasters and the on the ground experiences of those following these events uh, both tell us the same thing. They basically are telling us that climate disasters are borne by our most um, vulnerable communities. Some populations that are more likely to experience the most impacts resulting from climate disasters includes a racially and ethnically minoritized populations, low income households, older adults, individuals with disabilities, children, and those that may be experiencing homelessness or immigrant populations. Um, lower income households often have a decreased ability to both prepare for and recover from climate disasters. So for example, in order to prepare for a hurricane, this may often call for evacuation of a specific area. Um, however, evacuation requires resources. People leaving their homes may require transportation, money for a place to stay, potentially medications for an extended period of time, as well as advanced time off of work to prepare for these events. And many of these things are luxuries which aren't afforded to those households with lower incomes, placing them at an increased risk of physical harm. Uh, those that have to remain in place um, a lack of, often have a lack of financial resources, and so they may still um, prevent them from recovering as soon as possible. 
another group, older adults and also individuals with disabilities may have similar difficulties with evacuating away out of harm's way. Uh, these populations are especially prone to difficulty evacuating, particularly because those um, include individuals that may be residing in long-term care facilities. Um, evacuating can require for these populations uh, medical assistance, um, equipment, and medications that just may or may not be available at that time. Uh, those individuals who are forced to shelter in place can be met with power outages and reduced medical assistance, which can impede their health and in some cases even result in death. A dispro the disproportionate burden of climate disasters on these communities is not by happenstance. Uh, this burden is largely impacted by historical policies that continue to reverberate throughout these communities, as well as by lack of present day policies to mitigate these burdens. For example, as a result of historical racial residential segregation laws, Blacks are now more likely to suffer from a lack of investment um, or actually more likely to reside in areas that have higher occurrences in heat waves. They also are more likely to reside in areas that have a lack of investment in things like tree canopy, which can mitigate the impacts of extreme heat. So this combination has resulted in increased exposure to heat waves, heat waves as well as increased vulnerability among Blacks. Uh, climate disasters not only disproportionately impact the physical health of vulnerable, vulnerable communities, but it can also impact the mental and economic well-being of these populations from things such as job losses and even entire communities being displaced. While these losses can occur in any community, even wealthy and healthy ones, the communities that, have, uh, that I've noted um, often have a decreased ability to adapt and to respond to these events. And this is not a mere result of the community's ability to come together in these time of need, but it's often the result of resources that are funneled to the community before, during, and after the climate disaster. While it is important that we do acknowledge the harm that results um, from climate disasters, we must simultaneously keep our focus on strategies and approaches that can be effective in preventing and reducing these impacts. So what can be done? Well, first we can focus on incorporating more citizen science into policy. This in itself can expand the amount of scientific data that can be generated um, as opposed to research scientists alone and can reduce the gap in expert knowledge that's necessary to address climate inequities. Also, target priority funding for communities most burdened by climate disasters is critical. This target funding must occur before, during, and after climate disasters. Third, cumulative impact assessments can be more frequently used as a decision-making tool to identify the total burden that communities are experiencing and as it relates to their health, well-being, and quality of life. And lastly, climate mitigation and adaptation policies must be just. So when we're creating things like transit-oriented development or urban green projects, it is imperative to ensure that these efforts don't result in climate gentrification and the displacement of vulnerable residents. There's not a sole approach that will remedy the inequitable burden of climate disasters on vulnerable communities. However, combining research from scientists, skills from practitioners, knowledge from communities, and the power of legislation will allow us to begin to down the road of climate equity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janae, for bringing up these very important points. And I look forward to discussing this more in the Q&A too. Thanks so much. Um, next, we're gonna to turn to Ben. And Ben, it would be great if you could talk about how we can manage and address climate variability. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, and I think just building on the remarks of my colleagues, I just wanna make maybe two points uh, as we go into the Q&A. Uh, the first thing is that we need to get better at we, counting what we care about. I think Janae just spoke very eloquently to that. As an example of this, uh, many of you might be familiar with NOAA's Billion Dollar Disaster Report. It's a really useful tool that well-researched NOAA releases every year and shows us where some of the most damaging uh, natural disasters have occurred. Um, and it does this in just kind of real consumer price adjusted terms. And so we can see that total damages are increasing over time. 
Um, this increase in damages uh, has to do with a number of factors, you know, increased exposure of assets, changes in the nature of vulnerability to damage, and also an increase in hazard strength due to climate change. When you think about something like a billion dollar disaster tool, uh, there are some significant limitations. You know, first off, it's an economic indicator that is inherently regressive related to, uh, relative to lived human experience. Right? Anytime you're counting something in dollar terms, you're not capturing adequate weight of those things that do not carry high uh, monetized value. Secondly, it's the billion dollar disaster study. So it's only looking at the biggest events. We're not nearly as good at counting damages from the accumulated localized events um, that are affecting many, many people and increasing, affecting an increasing number of people each year. They're local disasters, even if they don't always make the national news. Third, um, when you think about something like a disaster report that's focused on economic impacts, you end up being biased towards stationary assets and immediate impacts. And so they try to count everything, right? But really what you're gonna be getting is the infrastructure that's hit and hurt and then you can count. Um, but in fact, who and what is affected by a disaster changes as a disaster unfolds. You've got these dynamic vulnerability profiles. And there's also this very long tail that we're all very familiar with on disaster impacts. And that affects different people, different sectors, different communities differently. And so we can't just look at what is the immediate damage and kind of an insurance claim terms. We need to look at tracking what's going on afterwards. And so why does all this matter? I mean, we want to get it right, but um, from my perspective and the work that I do, I think it's really important because we actually do have a plethora of tools to reduce vulnerability to disasters. We're actually pretty good at it in some cases. Um, at Johns Hopkins, a lot of my work is on improved early warning systems, anticipatory adaptation, and some of my colleagues spoke to other tools that we have at, at our fingertips. Um, and there are a host of infrastructure planning and behavioral actions we can take, but when we're gonna make these decisions, um, we aren't fully informed. And so I would say that a fairly modest investment could go a long way to support more informed and participatory decision-making processes. Um, and it's for us to get a better at how we count what's being damaged and how we coordinate both during and after an event to leverage that information in our response. So we could do this, I think, pretty clearly. First of all, we count, we should be counting more than dollars. We need better integration of socioeconomic data, health outcomes over time, uh, weather information, uh, that's going to allow us to move from a billion dollar disasters model to more human focused multi-criteria assessments of damages to our country. This would also inform real-time collaboration across agencies and other actors to exchange information as a disaster unfolds. which can just be tremendously important in terms of saving lives. Um, secondly, we need to, to use the data to systematize our preparedness and response to climate related hazards of all sizes. So not just the biggest ones, but how do we get better at um, implementing this in a way that we don't have a manual approach. Hey, there was a big disaster. No one should go out and count it, but that actually we're inventorying everything that's happening, accumulated exposures. Um, and finally, we should integrate the dynamic assessment of vulnerabilities. And so relying on static census data isn't a bad start. We're blessed with a lot of, of data and we should coordinate better on that. We also need to track vulnerability patterns as they move during a normal day, uh, during a disaster, after disaster. We have the tools to do this. We simply need the data integration and an investment in that kind of a databasing initiative, information systems, uh, real-time dashboards could be really, really valuable. So my, my second point, which I'll make really quickly because I know I'm, I'm using up my time here, um, is that we are seeing an increase in record shattering compound and cascading hazards. So what are those? So record shattering, in other words, not just think about the Northwest heat wave of 2021. It wasn't just big, it was tremendously big. It was much larger, far outside lived experience. And that's happening increasingly under climate change. Compound and cascading hazards are these interactions. So think about uh, Hurricane Ida where you had a heat wave coming after a hurricane during COVID, right? We're not great um, at evaluating risk under those circumstances or coordinating our responses. And so I think that at a minimum, one thing that we could do is support a multi-agency effort. So starting maybe with federal agencies, but of course it, we'd have to engage people across scales, across sectors, across uh, different kinds of institutions to look at the potential impacts and response strategies for rare or unprecedented events because they might be rare, but they're becoming more and more common and they have huge impacts. Um, and at this point, there's really no reason for us to be caught by surprise by these record shattering events. We know that they're coming um, and we just need to build the systems to be ready for them. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Ben. Um, so now we're on to the, the most interesting part, right? We're gonna do the live Q and A. Um, and please remember audience to go ahead and continue to submit your um, questions as we go. And our first question is natural disasters are always going to occur. So when will we ever feel like we are at our best when we respond to them? 
what are ways that we could measure a good response versus a not so good response? Who would like to take that one first? I, I can start off from, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did you want to go, Paul? Sure, I was just going to point out this to, for the first part of the question, that there are always going to be trade-offs. Economists, that's their main point when they come to any policy meeting, that there's going to be trade-offs and tensions uh, in, in the approaches. And therefore, there's always going to be this sense where we are going to need innovations to improve and mitigate those trade-offs, to reduce those trade-offs. So like with the the tension between disaster relief. We don't. The solution is not to get rid of disaster relief uh, or just leave it as the status quo. That, that, that tension will always be there, and that we'll have to find innovative ways to to mitigate that tension and reduce that tension. But like most things in life, there will never be a point where everybody says, "Ah, we've made it." Right? That there's no there's no further space or room for improvement. That there will always be these opportunities to improve. And right now, there's a huge amount of space for improvement. But I suspect given change in climate, changes in exposure and the value of, it, of what's exposed to risk that we're always going to need innovative ideas to uh, mitigate trade-offs and, and advance us towards a better outcome. So Matt, did you want to also answer on that one? Yeah, it really is a, it's a and uh, Paul, it was very eloquently said, um, so I'm not going to try to repeat it. Um, but um, what I would offer is that from a, uh, from an operational perspective, we think about uh, the core goal, the core tenet of disaster response is to return a community or to a disaster affected area to their pre-disaster conditions as quickly as possible. Now, as you've heard my colleagues say over the past 40 minutes or so, um, that's a problem when, when there have been uh, a multitude of factors that have made things not necessarily idealistic, not fair, and not appropriate to begin with. So if we're starting with one hand tied behind the back, then then where what is our goal to really to get to? And is getting back to where the way it was really good enough, or do we have to look towards something better? And and as we look towards that something better, can we do that in a way uh, where where we are beginning to make ourselves more able to respond to the next disaster or uh, less of a threat. And with, uh, with with a large percentage of our population living in low coastal areas and being susceptible to rising waters and also being susceptible to, uh, to, to successive threats, um, as you heard, not just a pandemic, but a hurricane on top of a pandemic, uh, not just a tornado, but a tornado on top of a, 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 of a wildfire and other things like that. This is where it gets complicated. So I would, I would, um, to the person who asked that question, I would congratulate you on a fantastic question. And I would say we have to look at the individual metrics that we consider to be essential goals of the response. And I'll turn it over to my colleagues for anything else they want to add. So just following up on that, thank you for those answers. You know, Ben, you talked about not only measuring everything by money. So I feel like if we try to think about a good way to measure a good response, it will most likely be about money and focusing in probably on the healthy and wealthy so, um, Janae, I'd love to hear your thoughts also on uh, the vulnerable communities and how we might be able to measure what would be a good response versus not as good response. Ben, do you want to talk first about the money uh, aspect and the non-money aspects? How do we measure those? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there are various ways to do it. So we've been working a lot with colleagues at the Department of Health in Texas, for example, looking at some recent major hurricanes. Um, and looking at how different demographic groups and different uh, you know, vulnerability um, profiles uh, did or didn't end up showing up in the health system um, in the wake of that hurricane. And so, you know, that's not yet getting to the answer of the success, that's getting to the answer of the impact, but I mean, you need a baseline first. Uh, and so there would be one thing that we could say, and, you know, I'm not against the idea that I understand we need some simplified metrics, and sometimes that means putting everything into a dollar figure at the end, making a lot of assumptions about what everything's worth. Right. I, I understand that, but I think that we need to, in the process, um, if we're going to roll everything to a dollar figure, elements like that should be accounted for, not just, you know, property damage, which I think is a lot of what's based on right now. Um, and also, even if we're going to roll into a dollar figure for some purposes, uh, we should have a transparent process that includes all the inputs and so that we understand um, what we are really counting, right, so that we can, we can dive into that when we need to. Um, so I think that uh, elements like this, and then also the long tail of the disaster, and, and uh, Janae can probably speak better this, to this than I can, but just to, just to note that tracking for longer is so critical for understanding the, the kind of long lasting impacts that we see on different communities. Great. 
And so, Janae, the, um, if you want to go ahead and answer that one, and then there's an, another follow-up question for you also. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I'm going to piggyback off of what um, Matt said. Like, I think the metric needs to be quite different for these vulnerable communities. And I always like to think of it as um, the goal is equity. So he's right. If we're leaving them where they were to begin with, that we're not meeting our goal, right? The goal is to have um, have these individuals more better able to respond to climate disasters, hopefully to have better mitigation policies and practices in these areas and these communities. And so I think more attention needs to be focused on um, one, what is the community saying they need, right? Because they can always tell us the best, what are their concerns and what are their major issues around uh, natural disasters. Um, and then also, I just drew a blank. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think the first point is that we always want to go to communities first. And now my next point is that to look at this through, as Ben mentioned, a long-term lens and to do things, as I mentioned, like, um, cumulative impact assessments where we're looking at not only just health impacts, but what is their overall well-being look like? How does this uh, impact them financially on a community level, but also for individuals within that community? Great. That's actually a great lead into our next question, which was about um, how public health emergency professionals can think about improving their methods to identifying populations at greatest risk. And I think the resilience piece is in two places, right? So does the system have more resilience to help those vulnerable communities as well as the building individual resilience within the um, communities for extreme weather events? So Janae, I don't know if you wanna talk about that and then maybe Matt, you could also follow up on that. Um, so so I'm, I don't know a ton about emergency response, but I, I will say that many of these communities are often plagued with other issues, right? So this is not the only one, this is not the area in which they've been neglected historically. And so there are often connections to things like the, the health department, emergency response, related to other issues that aren't necessarily a natural disaster. And so I think if, if when a natural disaster occurs, we can think of what are the communities that have already been tagged that we know um, have some of these issues, then they might be a good place to go to start. But I think Matt can probably tell us a little better about that. Yep. Sorry, trying to find the unmute button. No, I, I think that's right. I think that, um, you know, look, there, there's two sides of this. The first is when we think about uh, emergency response to these situations and at-risk populations, unfortunately, we can probably all close our eyes right now and imagine hearing a newscast from the other room in, in your home or your office about a tornado that just occurred or about uh, about a hurricane in a low-lying urban area and what that might look like and a picture of a helicopter hoisting people off their rooftops and all these things. And there's certain iconic images uh, that, are, that tend to be burned into, in, into our minds about these kinds of things. And, and the trick is to, I think, uh, what I'm trying to say is to, is to, is to use our lessons learned from prior events about where we need to foster resilience. You hear that term a lot. It's because it's, it really is what this is all about and also readiness, um, but also how can we do a, a develop better warning systems? I will tell you that, that in one of the EMS programs that I'm the medical director of, um, we suffered a historic and catastrophic flash flood uh, twice in a matter of a few years. Uh, and, uh, and, and as a result of that, uh, there's been significant investment in the warning systems and and notification systems and and helping engage the community and um, Janae, I really liked what you said about about just we just need to also engage that community. It will not happen without proper partnerships with community level people and and that includes a lot of things. It's civic leaders. It's faith based leaders. It's getting out there, doing outreach. It's listening to people, listening to their stories. 
because uh, their stories they want to be told and then working together, right? This is about people helping people. I don't mean to, to be metaphoric about it, but really we're all in this together and we need to think about it that way. Um, stopping the us versus them uh, is one thing. Now, how does that operationalize into strategies and practices? Well, there's best practices happening all over. And I think leveraging technology, doing what we're doing right now to share that information is, is one of the best things to do. Uh, but but we need to give people the tools, um, help them, and and build collaborations uh, to help increase our readiness. And I'll turn it back to you, Beth, because I know I can keep going, but I'll stop. Great. Well, no, this is really helpful discussion. And building on this, we just have another question that just came in. Oh, go ahead, Paul. I was just gonna can I, can I just follow up on that last one, just just to highlight just one thing that's often when people talk about individual level resilience, particularly in poor communities that the adaptation investments where you're trying to do things for the future about foregoing benefits now for benefits in the future, right? Investing now, costs now, benefits in the future. And for poor people, that is often a big challenge to, to do. And so, you know, if individual resilience building is challenging, and that's why system level resilience and early warning systems and things like that would be maybe better. And the other thing is, if you're thinking about building individual resilience, Focus on things that have quick payoffs for folks. That's going to be much more likely to, to work well than things that have longer payoffs uh, for more, it may be catastrophic, but less frequent uh, events. That's going to be less likely to be effective for individual resilience in those communities. Can I, can I add one more thing? I know there's another question, but but I think that there's a good cadence to this. And that would, I, I, and Paul, you said that really well. What I would add is one of the Achilles heels that we've had of disaster readiness and response previously up until now has been the fact that disasters historically occur, major events that you've heard my colleagues talk about today have historically occurred with a cadence and a rhythm that spaced them out to the point where they were just long enough spaced out for people to forget how bad they were and what the impact was. Unfortunately, that is now changing. And and I think uh, to Paul's point about bolstering resilience uh, and, and, and thinking about where the biggest uh, opportunity for impact is, is that's I think that our thoughts about this have to change as well, because now all of a sudden this is going to go in from being on you know, being from something that was on someone's mind a few years ago to being something every hurricane season. We now have to think about a major cat five storm hitting the East Coast every every wildfire season. We now have to think about what this could look like. So um, it it's it it is going to become more front and center. And I think with that will be an opportunity uh, as we balance the hierarchy of needs of everyday life versus disaster readiness. Great points, yeah. Um, so I think the next question is actually a follow up to some of what um, Paul, you were just talking about that you and um, Janae, you also talked about prevention as a key feature in reducing response needs and inequities. And um, you know, Paul, you were talking about this a little bit already, but what maybe are some effective prevention strategies? And I guess I would ask you, Paul, too. You said that you know the the immediate impact ones would be better. Maybe if you could give us some concrete examples of what that could be. Uh, well, that actually is, I think that's part of the where we need the innovative ideas uh, in, in that domain. A lot of what we're asking people to do is even two, three years, four years, if that's the timeline, is, is, is quite uh, broad. I, I would actually just also just remind everyone that we often focus on resilience specific initiatives when simple things like education and income are, are can play really big roles, right? It's leveraging the programs that already exist. Because one of the issues is that a lot of vulnerable communities are part of this set of what's called extreme repetitive loss properties, meaning they're constantly getting hammered. And we keep bringing them back to the same level or trying to bring them up at the same location. That's not necessarily as good a strategy as actually just improving their wealth and education so that they can re reduce their exposure to the risk rather than us trying to help them be resilient uh, to that risk. So that, uh, that's another approach is that don't, get so focused on resilience that we forget about the broader factor of, of, of social and human capital and income uh, are a big reason why we see these communities being vulnerable. Can I just jump in on that really quickly? Because I, I fully agree with what Paul said. Um, and also to this question of, you know, what are some kind of things we can implement now? Um, better use of our forecasts of these events, I think, can be useful. And so this is, you know, more to the resilience point, not the uh, necessarily long-term structural change. Um, but tools like forecast-based financing um, for interventions 
where you can actually say, okay, we know something's coming and we can get resources to people in advance rather than after. Because classically what happens is the way this always works is you don't get the aid until it's too late uh, and then it's more expensive and it's also less helpful to your well-being, right? If all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're gonna help you out after an event when someone maybe couldn't afford to uh, protect, protect their property in anticipation of a disaster or get themselves out of harm's way in anticipation of a disaster. Um, and the reason forecast-based financing is difficult is because you're making money move based on an uncertain prediction. Um, but getting ourselves to the point where we're better at accepting the, uh, the, the burden of decision-making un under uncertainty, knowing that sometimes you're gonna give out money and the disaster is not gonna hit, right? And accepting that uh, because on the balance, every analysis that I've seen of this is that it would just be so much better for people and in fact also better financially um, for the system if we were able to make those difficult prediction-based investments. I completely agree with everything that's been said so far. And I also want to point out um, something that I think we really don't do enough is to focus on um, working across sectors, right? So, so we have different areas, but they're all intertwined and they all impact uh, natural disasters. And this isn't just related to the environment. So for example, more of a focus on chronic health conditions and alleviating those in these specific populations would then reduce vulnerability to the disasters, these disasters. Um, yes, even if they still lived in the same home and experienced the same disaster, if we have fewer chronic conditions during this time, maybe more people are able to evacuate. Um, maybe there aren't issues of people needing to get medication during this time or, or fewer older adults um, in a in a facility who can't get away from the natural disasters, right? So there there are other things that we can do besides just focus on the environmental aspect. Also, if we think about um, the way our roads are built and our housing and just our infrastructure, to be thinking about the environment um, and these communities as instead of just doing this separately, to be thinking about well, what would happen during a natural disaster as we're changing these things. So I think it's really important for us to just not think um, agency by agency, but just to, to think together, even individuals who work with the homeless population. Okay, so what's our strategy for when a natural disaster occurs to, um, to reach these individuals? Great points, thank you, Janae. Um, Paul, I think this last question, we'll start with you, um, is the, um, can you speak to the economic cost of the recovery efforts? And is the cost of these disasters due to them increasing in size and frequency or both? And how can we make sure that the US government is best prepared to take on these challenges? Well, the answer to this size, uh, frequency, and both is is the answer. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the first question about speaking more to the economic cost of recovery efforts, but I'll address the last because I think it's linked. Is you know part of the problem is that this is the problem with you know why we don't maintain our infrastructure, but we build new infrastructure is that it's hard to to see the benefits of some of these behind the scenes efforts to increase the resilience of our systems. But disaster relief and showing up and handing things out and uh, helping people is much more visible. So we have an incentive problem, sort of a misaligned incentive problem that the rewards to politicians and to uh, others are often not aligned with doing this kind of harder to see and, and measure the impacts immediately uh, of the investments. And you know that's just a perennial problem that lots of people have struggled to work on. I don't have solutions, but it is a continual struggle to try to get people to commit to doing these invisible or less visible efforts to improve long-run resilience rather than to address the problem after it's it's taken place. Um, my other, uh, other co-panelists maybe have some specific ideas on that. So I'll, I'll jump in for just a quick second um, and, and I would offer, it's a very interesting question. There is no one singular answer to any of this stuff, which is why we're talking about it. Um, but um, but I would offer, I would pose one, one thought for you all and, and for our audience joining us today, which is instead of asking about the economic cost of recovery efforts, uh, taking Paul's thesis that he just shared and taking it one step further and say, thinking about the economic cost of preparedness efforts, right? Because if we, if we spend the money preparing, uh, then 
presumably things go well. And, and it becomes harder to measure when something doesn't happen than when it does. And, and that is one of the fundamental challenges that we face in public safety. It is one of the fundamental challenges we face in emergency preparedness. And it is one of the, in a modern society, it's one of the challenges we face. If we're going to, we're going to assume there's a certain cost to have society operate the way that it is. Now, taking that concept back to the question here, um, as we think about the cost of recovery efforts, uh, we know there's concrete costs, that, that things are going to cost more to do. Um, but I would also offer that, that there is a stuff phenomena to this. It's not just the dollars. Clearly, there's a fiscal piece, but there's a physical logistics piece of all this as well that we have to think about. And the ability to have access to that time critical equipment is incredibly challenging. What we didn't talk about today are the other challenges facing our response systems, drug shortages, equipment material shortages, things like that, that we have to think about from a supply chain perspective. Um, so even with the funds being available, if this stuff doesn't physically exist, or the medications are on back order, or you can't get them there, um, uh, we're, we're we we the, we are we are an interconnected society, and we have to think about this. So it's the cost is uh, is both physical, it's financial, it's also there's also an emotional piece and that cost as well, which which I think we have to we have to be cognizant of. People take these scars with them the rest of their lives. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think we saw all of that during COVID. So um, you, you make some really good points. So we're going to wrap up. I'm going to ask each of you to just kind of give your one or two key takeaways um, from the session and what you would want to leave our uh, um, participants with uh, your final thoughts. So maybe we'll, we'll start with you, Ben. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's so many things to be said here and so many new ideas from this conversation for me, um, but I'll just reiterate a couple of things I think that the federal government can do right now, right? Which is investing in systems to count what we care about um, and investing in initiatives uh, to collaborate across institutions within the government outside um, to be better prepared for extreme unprecedented events uh, that we're seeing more and more of in this country. Great, thank you, Ben. How about you, Janae? Um, I just want to impress the importance of when we're thinking about natural disasters and the impacts to not only think about um, how it affects our physical environment, but how it affects the health of these vulnerable communities and not just the physical health, um, Matt mentioned several times, the mental health, the financial health of these um, communities, their ability to withstand another event after this, another disaster, because it is likely to happen. Um, and to to make these communities a priority as we move forward. And so doing that may require that we work across different agencies, um, but I think uh, doing that and working with communities will make, um, will make our improvements stronger and things that can actually be implemented and effective. Great, thank you so much, Janae. Uh, Paul, how about you? Yeah, just as a, a, a narrow takeaway message, this idea of having people understand risk better and communicating risk better so that individuals can make better decisions, I think, is, is a critical going forward. But it's also important, I think, for this idea of how do we get political support for the kind of investments people are talking about. I think that people's inability to imagine what these counterfactual worlds would be like if we had better, if we had invested earlier rather than waiting to clean up afterward. You know, that's that's hard to get your head around. You can see the cleanup, that's you can see what's done, what wasn't done. But this idea of like what would the world have been like had we changed what we had done earlier, that's much harder for people to visualize and therefore support. Uh, and without that political support, it's gonna be hard to get these sorts of investments that we're talking about uh, across the board. And so I'm hopeful that. Uh, with better risk communication and understanding, we'll have a, a widespread uh, benefits, both at the, uh, the decision maker context, people making adaptation, as well as the community and political support level. Great. Thank you, Paul. And Matt. Well, it's hard to follow uh, that lineup of my colleagues here, but, but what I would offer is uh, two thoughts in close out. Uh, the first is there is absolutely no part of the United States or that of the world that is immune to or protected from natural disasters. Uh, and those disasters may manifest themselves in a variety of different forms physically, uh, but this is a vulnerability that we all have and we need to address it that way. We need to think about it. We need to think about disasters, not just uh, as this concept of something that might happen, but something that will happen. And, and the other thing I would say is 
is that as, as we think towards these problems, uh, we need to make this dialogue and take this uh, from being an episodic and, ca and, and occasional conversation topic to a more frequent and regular one and invest in it uh, adequately, as, as you heard my colleagues say. Thank you. Great. Well, I just want to thank all of our fantastic panelists in this great discussion. I also just want to take a minute to shout out a thank you to all of the first responders, emergency medical people um, that are working hard in these disasters um, and the policymakers and all of your staff members that maybe are on this briefing. We want to thank you all for your support and interest in this important topic. Um, I also wanted to just let you know a recording of this event will be available on this website, which is the online home of the Johns Hopkins Congressional Briefing series. So thank you. And um, thanks, everyone, for uh, working to put this together. Thank you.